Welcome back to the Journey Podcast. I'm so excited today because we are talking about one of my most favorite topics, which is how to go from your side hustle to being your main hustle. In other words, how do you leave your full-time job to eventually make that transition to being a business owner that is 100% dedicated to your business? Hey everyone, I'm Morgan Debon, a passionate entrepreneur and life advisor. With the Journey Podcast, you'll discover that success isn't about the destination, it's about the journey. I'm sharing stories of amazing people who've taken control of their lives. Join me on my own journey to discover the secret sauce behind reaching success with permission from no one else. In today's episode, I am joined by my best friend and partner in life, Mr. Joshua Shaw. He's joining me because we're talking about this transition, which he recently did in the last few years. I did this transition over 10 years ago when I went from working in my full-time job to having a side hustle and then making my side hustle my main hustle. And so today, Josh is going to walk us through his experience and how he did it and hopefully give us some tips along the way on how you can do it too, because it is possible to quit your job and eventually replace your income from your main job by doing a variety of different things as a freelancer and then eventually making your freelance income big enough that you have the stability to really start investing it into scaling your business and hopefully hiring people. So Josh, welcome. Thank you. To today's episode. We're here. My love. We're here. Okay. So um, for those people who aren't aware Walk us through your career journey and briefly just tell us kind of what you do as an individual and then what your company does. Career journey, where would you like for me to start? Let's start with you went to college Mm -hmm. and then you dropped out. Yeah. So I attended the University of Alabama, Birmingham. Uh I had a music scholarship, which a lot of people do not know. He's a band boy. I played trombone, uh, started in middle school. (laughs) All the way through high school, all the way through college. So that paid for school. Mm -hmm. So the goal was to go to University of Alabama, get my degree in business marketing. Mm -hmm. My father had, at that time, a construction management company. Mm -hmm. And I was going to kind of follow in that family footstep, come back and do something business related in the family business and the construction industry. So obviously entrepreneurship was already in my DNA because Mm -hmm. that's all I've ever known, Mm -hmm. um, watching my father do what he did. Uh, Shortly after two years in college, pledged alpha, you know, everything was going great, but I just wasn't feeling fulfilled, Mm. right? I wasn't feeling fulfilled. I was making good grades, but just wasn't feeling fulfilled. Mm -hmm. So I uh, was working at the Apple store, as was my like summer job Mm -hmm. uh, while I was studying. Um, and that's kind of how I first got introduced into, you know, the technology of what I do. Mm. Okay. Um, so while I was there, I was like, you know, I'm just not feeling fulfilled. I just remember calling my parents saying, Hey, I know it seems like everything's great, but I really just want to come back home, Mm. reset, Mm -hmm. uh, and really see what I can do in the video field. Mm. I didn't have a clear plan. I just knew that if I can get back home, I can kind of reset, Mm -hmm. figure that plan out. Mm -hmm. So I'm just kind of fast forwarding through a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. So I was able to come back to Nashville, um, started freelancing. Mm -hmm. Freelancing, just videoing anything, Mm. you know. So came back to Nashville. I started in the party scene. Mm. So I was the guy filming the content in the club. The club videos. Yeah, the party promotion <laughs> videos. Uh, but as you know, that's just quick money, little money. Quick money. You $500, can't build, $300. Yeah. But at that time, I felt like it was $100, I $150. Mean, true. Inflation that, is a bitch. <laughs> okay. So that's not sustainable. I you mean, for, for what it's worth, you lived in yeah. Tennessee. It's not like your rent was $10,000 a month. Well, I'll still say it's not sustainable for where I really wanted to be. Yeah, but it wasn't that bad for okay. 20, how old were you, 23, 24? Yeah, young. Yeah, yeah. 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 So at that time, I knew that in order to get real clients, mm-hmm. going into an office, trying to sell yourself, mm. of saying, look what we could do. Mm-hmm. It's really tough to go into a corporate office and say, let me show you my portfolio (laughs) of club videos. (laughs) With the girls. So so I knew that I had to get something more sustainable under my belt. Okay. Facts. Okay. 
So the easiest way that I could do that is figure out what relationships can I do I already have. Mm. So one of the relationships that I already had was with the American Diabetes Association here mm -hmm. in Nashville. At that time, they used to do these things called Father of the Year. Okay. And it was a fundraising opportunity to highlight prolific entrepreneurs and fathers mm -hmm. that were in the state of Tennessee. Mm -hmm. I volunteered my services mm. to create some narrative base. So some of my first storytelling pieces, mm -hmm. which I use those as my portfolio pieces to kind of prove what we could do. Smart. So yeah. in other words, you very quickly realized, all right, club mm -hmm. videos are cool or whatever, mm -hmm. but if I really want to take this exact same skill set and increase the revenue that I'm getting for the exact same skill set, mm -hmm. I'm going to need some different clients. Yep. You know, and yep. at the same time, your portfolio, especially because you didn't go to school for mm -hmm. it, it's not like you had that range of, you know, when you go to mm -hmm. school, you get the range of content in your Absolutely. portfolio. You didn't have that. So you then said, all right, let me actually volunteer myself yep. to build out this differentiated portfolio. And then you were able to do what? One of the things that I quickly realized in order to take it to the next level, I needed to invest in myself and invest in technology. Mm. I was able to do that immediately. Mm -hmm. Okay. By investing in the technology, I also said I need to get a little bit more experience. When you say invest in technology, what do you mean by that? So camera equipment, mm. lighting, mm. audio equipment, all the things that I felt would take me to the next level, mm. I had to do that. Were you renting it before? Was renting. Okay. So you yep. said... I was actually using, when I first started, tape. What do you mean tape? Actual physical <laughs> tape. Like a VHS? It, uh, they were many, I don't even know what they were called, but mini tapes. <laughs> Like literally putting them in tapes. I had a camera. You sound light. like fifty yeah. years old. Josh is not fifty years old. But I'm just old, saying. By the but way. that's how that's how quickly technology has advanced. Yeah, okay? yeah, yeah. So had to do that. Then I recognized, okay, in order to take it to the next level, I need to get more consistent income, but mm -hmm. also more skill sets to really know what I'm talking about because I wasn't formally trained in this. Mm -hmm. So I took a position where I could be the video director mm -hmm. or a videographer at the time before I was promoted to video, video director mm -hmm. to learn all the skills I needed hmm. in being able to run my business, so in which other was words, like the cheat code to be able to work at a place doing the exact same thing that you're building your business mm -hmm. to be mm -hmm. and almost be able to get paid. Well, not even almost being able to get paid to learn. Mm. and to perfect your craft to become a better director, to become a better storyteller, to mm -hmm. become a better business person because you're seeing the inner workings of an agency in the environment that you're actually employed at. Mm -hmm. One of the things I appreciate about you is that you don't have a lot of ego and you very much value investing in yourself in learning. So like mm -hmm. Josh is the kind of person where it'll be the end of the night and the average person would sit and watch Netflix at the end of the night. Josh watches YouTube videos on lighting. Like this man is obsessed with learning his craft. If I didn't know his backstory, you would never know that he doesn't have a classically trained, you know, NYU or USC, the best of the best kind of programs for cinematography and being a director because the quality of his work is so good. I remember when we first started dating, I was like, who is this like, man, what, how did you learn this? Mm -hmm. You know? And mm -hmm. now obviously spending our lives together, I can see how much time you spend mm -hmm. really, really learning. The other thing about what you just said that's interesting is that you were freelance, you were working for yourself, you were self-employed, and then you decided to get a full-time job. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have a hard time mentally going mm -hmm. what they would perceive as going backwards. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me a little bit about where your mental state was and advice for people who might be thinking, I'm trying it as a solopreneur. I'm trying it as a freelancer. I'm making money, but I'm having a hard time getting to that next mm -hmm. level of growth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, it was because my vision was always bigger than my present. Mm. So I, my advice to any aspiring person is you got to set a vision and you got to create a plan even when it may feel like it doesn't make sense to anyone else. You know, a lot of people didn't understand my vision, didn't understand what I was trying to do. But where I'm at today was was always a part of the end goal of what I saw for me. I didn't know how I was going to get there. Mm -hmm. But for me, I identified the quickest way to get to having employees, having, you know, not being what in our world, a one man band one person doing all the things. To get away from that, I need to understand how did it work. 
because I didn't go to school for it. So I needed to know what is the role of a project manager? What is the role of, you know, a graphic designer for content, sound, I, you know, all those little nuances or better yet, how do I direct pieces and projects for people who don't look like me? That's right. That was one of the biggest things, right? How do I get more comfortable in the director seat, not being the person behind the camera? Mm. How am I the person on the side of the camera or conducting a group of people mm -hmm. in order to take it to the next level? I felt like the quickest way to do that is go try to find a position mm -hmm. that I could work at full time, mm -hmm. very similar to what I'm doing, and then continue to freelance on the side as my right. side hustle so that I could continue to reinvest that back into the business mm. so that when you step away from your full-time job, you kind of jump out, you've kind of built a plan, right. you know? So you almost kind of have a safety net mm -hmm. because you were very intentional about all the moves that you were making mm. throughout that process of working somewhere, mm -hmm. you know? So that would be my biggest advice. If you're going to step out while you're working at your nine to five, be building your plan savings, investing, all those things while you while you've got the security of right. that W two. two. Yeah, I Make think sense? Yeah, hundred percent. Like in other words, a lot of times people have the W two and that they, they get complacent. They mm -hmm. get comfortable. They get like, okay, I'm good. I'm gonna mm -hmm. go to brunch. I'm gonna go on these trips. I'm mm -hmm. gonna buy the Gucci. I'm gonna do the things. Mm -hmm. And they get distracted. That's what I call the golden handcuffs, mm -hmm. right? And you get distracted and then you're trying to then be like, try to understand why you're not making progress towards your side hustle becoming your main hustle. And it's because you're not investing mm -hmm. all that money and all that discretionary income that you have right. to accelerate the speed and the velocity in which you're gonna be able to turn your side hustle into your main hustle. I agree. What Josh is really talking about is that he was able to buy all his equipment, mm -hmm. right? And use this income yeah. to buy your equipment and then also to build out your team. To build out the team. You know what I'm That's saying? That's another thing. I think that was the next inflection point mm. is, okay, how do you create something that's sustainable? Right. Up until this point, everything was dependent upon Josh. Mm. If you're not doing this, light setting the camera up, lighting, d directing, all those things, everything is dependent upon you. That's yeah. not sustainable. No. Right? And you can't build a business off of that. Right. How can you quickly identify your team? So how do you create your own organizational chart from watching it in real life. Mm. So I was able to do that. So many people get stuck here. Yeah. I think there's some crazy stat, like 85% of yeah. small business owners, particularly POC small business owners, are employee of one. Mm -hmm. So to go from employee of one mm -hmm. to being able to have multiple 1099 yeah. contractors, to have other people working yeah, for yeah. you, all while maintaining your full-time job yeah. is actually not easy at all. At what point did you know, okay, I've got my full-time job, I'm an autopilot at work. It's whatever. Mm -hmm. It's time for me now to take my next leap mm -hmm. and really go from full-time employee to full-time business owner. Mm -hmm. So I think it was two things for me. Number one was I wanted to make sure that when I jumped out, mm -hmm. I had a game plan and I also had all the basic necessities, meaning equipment, mm -hmm. to be sustainable. Okay. Right, so that I can immediately make profit and didn't have to rent. So if a client hired me, even if I was renting to them, they were actually paying me to mm. use the equipment that I've already invested okay, in. Okay, cash flow. Okay, yes. so that was the first thing. Yes. The second thing was say, do I at least have an editor? So before I had a project manager or anything, do I at least have an editor that I could depend on? Mm. And I did. Why Why was the editor important? Because if, if everything requires me to edit it, mm -hmm. right? then you're only limited to however many pieces of projects that you're able to do. But mm. you've got someone else that you could delegate to mm -hmm. that automatically gave you more confidence that I can actually take on more work. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so that was it. And then number three was making sure that I had some clients, as my father would say, in the hopper. Mm -hmm. That I already have some people or companies mm -hmm. or clients in the hopper that I can already start to allocate funds of like, oh, I can count on that. Yeah. I Did you have retainer clients yeah. already? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So that automatically made How many made retainer feel... clients do you think you had when you made that leap? Uh, like, was well, it enough to replace your income? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Your and, monthly and, income. Yeah. And it was consistent. Okay. And these were people that I had been building relationships with all through the freelancing process. Right. 
So I was cons- sustaining those relationships year right. after year. They after weren't year. canceling the retainers. Nobody was canceling. Yeah. Nobody was canceling. And I think that's the other thing is like, you know, people view entrepreneurship as really risky, but there is a way to take calculated risk risks when mm-hmm. you're an entrepreneur, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, my takeaway from this is, and this is a process I talk about a ton with my work smarters and my advising mm-hmm. program is like, look, before you make this jump for your own mental sanity, mm-hmm. you need to be able to do the hard things, the ugly things. Mm-hmm. A lot of the work that you do was not sexy. It was mm-hmm. not club videos. It was not music videos. It was not like, it, you know, he said the American Diabetes Association or what'd you say? Yeah. Yeah. Like that's not the coolest thing, but that pays the bills. Yeah. Right. And so building out retainer clients that you know are going to replace place your income mm-hmm. and also not just your first retainer client you mm-hmm. didn't just jump mm-hmm. the first time you made some money mm-hmm. you said all right let me make sure these people are going to resign mm-hmm. year over year yeah. and take it slow so that when i make the leap i'm able to do so in a way that is a significant jump yeah right yeah and you know my world i call that the step change growth mm-hmm. that's the framework that i, I teach in my program it's the talk stuff we've talked mm-hmm. about which in other words is you know we're not making incremental changes in life mm-hmm. it's important that you make giant milestone changes and that you actually aim towards instead of going like this baby steps you go big jump up and then you're doing the work mm-hmm. you're building the team you're investing mm-hmm. in the equipment you're getting more skills, Mm -hmm. you're becoming a better leader. And then once you've done that and it's so comfortable that you're on autopilot, you take the next level up, which is becoming a business owner. Mm -hmm. And then that's really uncomfortable. So then you're doing that. You're learning how to run payroll. You're learning how to build org charts. You're making job descriptions. You're adding more people to your team. And that becomes really uncomfortable. And then it becomes easier. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, all right, now I'm going to go from business owner to now multi-million in revenue business owner, right. which is like, now I got taxes, right. now I got all these other problems. Right. And you just keep going up instead of these little itty bitty changes where I'm going to go from one client to two, two clients to three. If you change your mindset to think about step change growth and these big milestones, mm-hmm. in my opinion, it, it allows you to really be able to attach yourself to a bigger vision for your life. I agree. And actually be able to get there instead of one day you look up five years later and you know you've just gone from making a hundred thousand to hundred and twenty five thousand. Yeah. And it's like that I didn't even come up with inflation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So like as it relates to making those changes, once you made that transition back to being fully self employed, mm-hmm. but now in this new capacity mm-hmm. as a business owner, what are the things that you learned very quickly? Like what did you anticipate and what did you not anticipate? from that transition? Uh, I think I didn't anticipate the speed in which I was gonna need additional support. Okay. And so being able to quickly identify someone who could help me do that. So I was able to immediately identify someone who could help me find my project manager Mm -hmm. that was very competent and being able to bring that person in, that Mm -hmm. helped. Then it allowed me to identify other opportunities. I never like to call them weaknesses, but other opportunities in the business Mm -hmm. because you can do one of the things that you talk about all the time that a lot of people probably don't even think about is what are your operational tasks Mm -hmm. and then what are your CEO tasks? Mm -hmm. And literally, I would challenge anyone to take out a piece of paper or a whiteboard And if you are a freelancer or a solopreneur Mm -hmm. and you're looking to be able to add employees, even if it's just one employee, one Mm -hmm. additional employee, write down all the things that you do that a CEO, founder, owner should do. Mm -hmm. Then also write down on another column, what are all the other things that you may do Mm -hmm. that's operational and specific to your business? That's right. right? So that's what I had to do for mine. Mm -hmm. After I did that, I was able to easily identify what were some of the opportunities. That's right. And the, for me, what I mean by opportunities, what are some of the priority hires that you need to make? That's right. All this can't happen at once. No. Right? But I was able to quickly identify what those opportunities were and then prioritize those on a scale of, okay, how is bringing or onboarding this role how does that go against the income that I'm bringing That's in right. from the business? Right. And how does that determine, well, do I need to go after new business or do I need to renegotiate inside of the mm-hmm. relationships that we already have mm-hmm. 
to offset that where I'm able to afford that person mm -hmm. or afford that role, but also make a profit. So when I was able to quickly identify that, mm -hmm. then I was like, oh my gosh, this unlocks a whole new world. Yeah, so right? it, it's having a framework for deciding who to hire mm -hmm. and when and for what responsibilities and how those responsibilities are gonna to attach to revenue is so freeing. I meet so many mm -hmm. entrepreneurs that are completely stuck because they're fearful of what will happen when they make that hire. Because it's very vulnerable. Like when you sit down and really be honest with yourself, write that out, it's very vulnerable because in order for you to have made it to that point of entrepreneur, you had to have enough confidence in yourself that you were the best person at the job. Facts. But that could be a weakness if you continue to feel like you're the best person at each one of these roles. Listen, this man will edit something to death. I'll be like, babe, it is done, honey. It is good. It is a 10 out of 10. And you're like, yeah. Mm. Because you're a perfectionist. You're a, you're a perfectionist at mm. your craft. And it's really hard to find other people in the world and employees that are going to be just as a perfectionist about your work. Mm -hmm as you are. In mm -hmm. fact, I would argue it's impossible, mm -hmm. right? No one is going to think about Blavity and all the risk and all the things that we have to manage and the markets and the employees and the culture and all these things in the way that I am, because ultimately mm -hmm. it is my responsibility. It is a yeah. CEO task for me to care this deeply about everything going on in the business. I can't expect someone who is coming in new to care at the same level that I do. And as a business owner, when you're going to scale your company, you have to accept that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes accepting hard. that that's been hard is me. the hardest part. And so people just don't do it. Yeah, They're like, I can't find someone. They're not doing it right. They micromanage. And then it's like, you're wasting your time. That's been hard. But also the interesting part is we have too much work that one, no matter what, one person could do it all. Yeah, you, know? you are your biggest blocker now yeah. for growth. I mean, you've accelerated. It. I mean, we're we're talking quickly here, but it's yeah. you know, we're really talking a five to ten year mm -hmm. time frame. But yeah, you're at a point in your business now where you have more volume of work mm -hmm. than you have staff to yeah. get it done on time right. at the level in which you want right. it to. We now have three editors and we need more. Your That's constraint is your team. You know, the constraint yeah. is continuing. You know, we're it's... trying to hire right now. You see what I'm yeah. saying? So I think that's the... That's the blessing, yeah. you know, if you try to plan it out right. And don't get me wrong, there has been plenty of obstacles. You know, oh, this yeah. has not been, <laughs> you know, one of these little things. It's been this and this. And yeah. this. But I think the main thing is just believing in yourself no matter what. Yeah, investing in yourself. And investing in yourself no matter what. And to just stay in the course. That's right. Stay in the course. Okay, so going from freelancer to business owner, how did your day-to-day -day life change in terms of being a freelancer and then making that jump to being a business owner? Freelance, you kind of hope and pray. As a business owner, you've already projected and kind of know. So what I mean by that, as a freelancer, you're kind of hoping and praying someone calls you and says, hey, can you come help me with this one-off thing? As a business owner, you're already projecting what's needed. Mm. You know, you're forecasting. You already know what to expect mm -hmm. for the most part, or you should, month over month, quarter over quarter. Mm. So that gives you a whole lot more confidence when you lay your head down at night because you're not wondering where the next meal is coming from, mm. right? Because you've already planned it out. So I think that was the biggest difference. So then what I hear you saying is that a freelancer is oftentimes a reactive person. People are reaching out to you mm -hmm. and they're saying, hey, I would like for you to work on this project. Mm -hmm. Are you available? Mm -hmm. As a business owner, you're saying, I'm proactive. I'm going to do outreach. I'm going to do marketing. I'm going to attract different leads, different parts of my business and revenue so that I can continue to grow and maintain mm -hmm. my cash flow. Mm -hmm. How did you go about making that transition from being reactive to proactive? Confidence. So I would go into situations sometimes not even having the full staff or the full team to actually execute it, but mm -hmm. I just believed in our ability so much yeah. that I was able to walk into the meetings and be like, oh, we could do that. <laughs> you know. We could do that, and I would never talk as if it was just a me thing, yeah. even if there were situations. I would always say, our team of creatives, I would say that all the time, our team of creatives can take your vision and bring it to life through our lens. And I would say it over and over again, and people would be like, okay, Bet. cool. Clear. And then when I leave the meeting, i will be like, okay, how do I gotta figure this out? Story of my life. But then once you stretch yourself like that, then it just becomes easier and easier and easier. Yeah. And then 
before you know it, all that stretching, you got those people on your staff. Yeah, they're on and the so, roster. Yeah, they're, you're, your roster is set. So it's now it's like, bring it on. You want to do a scripted piece? You want to do a documentary in yeah. Nigeria? I mean, whatever yeah. you want to do. Okay, and I can say we've done that before now. Right. So you walk with another level of confidence when you know you've done it. Mm. And then you have a secondary layer of confidence when you know you've got retainer clients already in the bag. Let's talk about retainer clients. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a dream for so many people. Yeah. And I always think it's crazy to me when I'm like coaching and mentoring advice, like agency owners, and they're telling me that they've got these one-off clients and they have repeat clients. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. So they're on a retainer and they're like, no. I'm like, okay, so this, how many years has this customer bought with you? Mm -hmm. You know, they've been working with me for five years and they're not on a retainer. Mm -hmm. There's no, some sort of minimum guarantee or MOU or, you know, memorandum of understanding or master service agreement, right. MSA. And they're like, no, <laughs> I'm like, all right, cool. That's a, that's a retainer is an incredible way, way to get some level of commitment from your client. Mm -hmm. And in turn, you make a commitment on the level of work and availability that you're going to give them Absolutely. and the speed of turnaround. Absolutely. And my question to you is how do you convince a client who's worked with you multiple times to go from ad hoc to a commitment? So that's always the plan with every client. So no matter what new client reaches out to us, our end goal is always to provide an excellent quality service on that first engagement with them to convert them into the retainer piece. Mm -hmm. And I think how we try to do it is by selling uh, overall value with what we call a content calendar. Mm -hmm. So our model is being able to literally sit down with that client and say, we add more value by understanding what your annual KPIs are and goals. Mm -hmm. And our team being able to come alongside you and create that content calendar and content plan mm -hmm. so that we could be on a more consistent cadence with you. So even if for that, for your company, that only means four pieces of content annually, mm -hmm. Well, we're already thinking through what that is. Mm. And then that allows you to go back to your decision makers to create a more strategic budget. Right. Versus a one-off engagement with us. Which is more expensive. Right. That's the other thing. You got to price the one-off mm -hmm. more expensive than the retainer. Yes. And oftentimes Josh yes. and I will be, you know, working on a plan for one of his clients and from a pricing perspective. And I'll say, all right, well, give them the retainer that they're going to say yes to knowing that they're eventually going to blow the retainer and they're going to need to do add-ons. Right. So get to the yes, mm -hmm. make it cheaper than the ad hoc mm -hmm. from a pricing perspective, but also leave wiggle room and build in into your terms if they go out of scope. Mm -hmm. then you could charge them more. Yeah. In every every situation, they always end up spending 10 to 20% more yeah. than what they thought about. But it continues to keep that relationship because they will always feel like they're getting more value. If you're delivering a quality product, mm -hmm. they will always feel like they're getting more value than what they're paying you. And, they and you want to keep it that way. They're getting more value yeah, exactly. than what they would have paid ad hoc exactly. because you are available. You are consulting exactly. with them. You are responding to their text messages in the middle of the night. Like yeah. You are more available. But I don't want to say that it's easy. It definitely was a formula and it took us a time to do that. Yeah. But I can confidently say that we're able to knock those things out the park, you know, Mm -hmm. because we've got good track record of proving of how mm -hmm. this works for companies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's a huge advantage. Okay, last question. How do you think about managing your personal finances and retiring if you are working full-time as an entrepreneur? So that's what a financial team is for, <laughs> <laughs> which I have, you know. Yes. So uh, being able to constantly, even if you're freelancing, working with whatever your financial advisor is, still building out a plan where you're constantly reinvesting into yourself and getting in the habit. Mm. So I think a lot of people think when it comes to investing, you know, it has to be these large sums of money, mm -hmm. right? Mm -mm. But consistent small amounts of money over a period of time is even more effective than just getting so stuck in this large. It's like, I don't even have any money. Well, do you have $100 right. that you could be putting aside? Do you have $1,000? Mm -hmm. Okay, do you got 2000 So I think being able to work with whoever your financial advisor is and having certain vehicles that I don't want to say various vehicles, but having certain vehicles that you could be putting your money into yeah. as you're freelancing. I'll say it. 
Yeah, well, you can say it. You know, yeah. I mean, I think that people should pay yourself first. If you're a freelancer and you're full time self employed, and that's the plan, you absolutely have to pay yourself first. Do not commingle your funds. And when I say commingle your funds, I mean you have two separate bank accounts one for your business and one for your personal life. Mm -hmm. Even though you are, all the money is yours and all the money you're like, I'm just paying myself to pay myself over here. Having two separate bank accounts allows you to have a mental and physical place to say, what's the mm -hmm. money that I'm using to reinvest in the company? Mm -hmm. And what's the money that I'm using to spend for my life and to invest in my life? Absolutely. And too often I see entrepreneurs when they're freelancers just have one big bucket. Mm -hmm. And then it makes it really difficult to clearly see this is the money that is going to be going into savings and into my myself created 401k mm -hmm. or into the S&P 500 or wherever it is that you're going to invest your money, which as Josh said, you know, go ahead and get your financial advisor to do that, which go to Fidelity or you can do it, you know, DIY it. But my recommendation is do not commingle your funds if you're really making that transition from full time to freelancer and also be really, really clear with yourself on how the taxes are set up and what money has to go back out mm. into the world because oh, that will yeah. also get you. Yeah. For me, I was that person. I was co-mingling everything, you know, <laughs> and, it, and you had to clean that up because now, you know, we pay taxes quarterly, you know, Tax. so, yeah. you know, lump sums of money. So you can't, you don't have wiggle room to be saying, oh, I'm going to put a little here and double dabble here it's and double dabble that. You know, I would tell people to have, if you can't have four accounts, just, just do it. You know, the quicker you can get into a habit of healthy money. Personal hygiene for yeah, your finance. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> healthy money. We're stumbling over our words because we're trying not to tell y'all what to do. But, yeah. but I agree with Josh. The accounts that I recommend for a small business owner that's a freelancer is you have your personal spending mm -hmm. money account. Yep. That's the money that's left over from everything else. Mm -hmm. You have your savings and investment account for your personal. Mm -hmm. You have your business cash flow expenses, mm -hmm. money that's that's coming in and out. And then you have your business investment account. Mm -hmm. And that's the money that you're spending to buy the equipment, to buy Whatever. the courses, to buy the programs, to buy the conferences, things that are gonna pay a dividend. Mm -hmm on you being able to grow and scale your business, not just manage the expenses and all the cash flow coming in and out. Mm -hmm. Those would be the four accounts that I recommend to any small business owner and freelancer that is self-employed. Absolutely. So what books, if any, have you read or are you reading that you would recommend to other people who are making this transition? Uh, I would say Profit First, I mm -hmm. think. And then Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Mm -hmm. You know, when your book comes out, that's going to be a good book for people to read. <laughs> <laughs> so I think there's a lot of books that you should read, but I would start there. Amazing. Cool. Well, honey, I'm so proud of you. Mm -hmm. I'm so lucky to be able to watch you on this journey mm -hmm. and to be your cheerleader and your business advisor mm -hmm. behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, one day you can retire me and make me a wealthy <laughs> housewife. <laughs> We're already wealthy. <laughs> okay, but I'm not a housewife. Uh, okay, retire me. <laughs> Yeah. Anyways, y'all, hopefully this episode was helpful for you. We have a ton of resources on all of these different frameworks that Josh and I are talking about in my WorkSmart Advising program. You can go to WorkSmartAdvisor.com to learn more about that. And also we have a retreat that I run every year called CEO Spring Break. CEO Spring Break is in May and it's so much fun. It's in Costa Rica 2024. And we walk through a lot of these frameworks. We do it together. I'm there to help you. Josh is there and a lot of incredible entrepreneurs have gone year after year. This will be our third year doing CEO Spring mm -hmm. Break. So I'm looking forward to hearing how you implement some of these ideas, these mm -hmm. frameworks. Think about your CEO task, your operating task. Think about what are you willing to sacrifice today so that tomorrow and the day after that, you can actually jump up in your business and achieve your step chase growth. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for joining us on today's episode. Thanks for listening to the Journey Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you leave a review and head to our Instagram and YouTube to leave a comment. I look forward to hearing how this podcast has made an impact on your own journey.